I'm Matthew Fenewald, and this is the second video in the immersion event series that we're doing is the shirt tail mess. And in this video, we're going to be covering accoutrements and weapons, or basically what would they have carried on what we're doing with this immersion event, which is a campaign against the natives. And so when we look at firsthand accounts of what did they actually carry, as we should do for anything we're doing living history wise, I think it's really common. You, there's a commonality you see in all accounts of what they carried. And it was basically just a few weapons, a minimal bedroll, a blanket, and uh, some kind of way to carry just your little bit of extra junk and food that you would take with you. And so there are two great, great, in my opinion, quotes from the period about what they would have carried on something like this. Uh, we did a blog post on them years ago. Um, you're welcome to look that up too. But the first one, would be a heavy blanket, rifle, hatchet, knife, powder horn, and powder, bullets, extra gun flint, a picker, a wallet well stored with parched corn, some salt, and a tin cup. This is a 1770s description of gear used on an expedition from General James Robertson. And then the second quote, um, a tin cup was tied to the strap of their knapsack. This store is a reserve never to be used till there is no other shift with a tomahawk, a butcher's knife, and rifle gun and blanket. This is the equipage of an Indian campaign. And that's from Thomas Rogers Sr. And I believe it's a uh, 1780s quote, if I recall correctly. So, okay, it's com same things in basically both quotes. They're carrying a gun, a hatchet of some type, a knife, a bedroll, and um, some kind of vessel, a tin cup. And... Yeah, just minimal, minimal stuff and minimal food, parched corn and jerky seems to be overwhelmingly what they would have carried. So now let's go over, here's what Jake and I kind of carry for some, what we will be carrying for something like this. Um, Jake has chosen a smooth bore, brown bess, and uh, they're common as heck in the period, for sure. All kinds of smooth bores all over the frontier and guys using them commonly. Uh, And the next option, and possibly more common for a frontier type thing like this, is a uh, rifle gun. Um, there's a ton of junk out there in the world of guns. And it can be really confusing, I think, especially if you're just first starting out on, like, what type of gun do you need to do something like this? Or, like, even what is right for 18th century stuff. And I think there's pretty common traits of what you see in an 18th century, 1770s, 1780s gun. And it's, uh, they're usually wide in the butt, at least two inches wide. They're brass mounted. They have brass hardware on them. They're uh, fully mounted too. They're not like barn gun shimmels where they're missing, you know, ramrods or like entry thimble type thing usually, which I say that and this one's missing an entry thimble, but you know. <laughs> um, anyways, they have, usually have carvings, nice simple uh, molding lines, carvings, flintlock obviously, and they're usually a fairly large caliber, um, at least 50 or above. Uh, and the patch box, a wooden patch box is really common. And then some later, the later you get, the more common the metal patch boxes become, it seems. Um, anyways, do your research on your gun because that's a huge investment before buying. And there's a lot of bad. Okay, next thing to talk about, they carried a hatchet or a tomahawk often, often, often. And uh, there seems like there's kind of two common styles to pick from pipe tomahawks are all over the trade list and ledgers of white guys buying them and also commonly listed in what they were carrying. And uh, yeah, it's just nice, simple pipe hawk. You can't go wrong. Dual purpose. If you're one of those guys that like to multi-purpose your gear all the way. And then just a regular tomahawk, just a small hatchet. Based on an original one, um, yeah, a nice pole tomahawk with a carrier for safety reasons. A lot of guys, they're, it's commonly listed they're just shoving tomahawks through the belts in the period, but it seems like more common these days guys carry for so you don't cut yourself some kind of sheath for your hatchet. And there are original ones to the period two carriers. And then knives. You don't need a giant crazy knife. Uh, the two most common knives on the frontier by far and away are just a simple trade knife, a scalper or a butcher. Um, 
tons of good makers of them out there. You don't have to spend a ton of money on one either. They're a pretty simple knife. And then folders. Uh, period folders are very common and very underrepresented, in my opinion, in the hobby these days. But uh, they're all over the archaeological report. And yeah, it's a simple 18th century folder. You don't have to, have to mess with a big old bell knife. Okay, and then a heavy blanket is always, uh, you gotta have a way to stay warm at night. And just a heavy wool blanket. The most common ones by far and away are white with an indigo stripe on either end. It's the trade blanket of the era, for sure. Um, there's not a lot of blanket makers out there, so I would just, you know, look and scour, see if you can find used ones. Sometimes it's a way to save money and get your blanket. Or two blankets if it's gonna be cold. I often carry two of them to be sleeping. It's gonna be down below 30 at night. Um, and I have mine tied up with a tump line, or a hoppus strap, I think is another, hoppus strings is another word for it. Um, mine's just a simple European made one, leather, a piece of bark tan, heavy leather for the strap and then tied up with ropes. And native ones are woven, usually from nettle or basswood bark. Um, and they're very common as well. And uh, I forget, there's one quote of white guys weaving them. <laughs> I forget it off the top of my head. Anyways, the, the, whatever your option on top line, they're very common, they're very right. Whether they be leather or just raw buffalo hide even for tying up your bedroll. Okay, and then next, with, along with your bedroll, a way to carry your stuff. One option is certainly to just roll up your stuff inside your bedroll if you just want to have one compact thing um, to carry everything. But then I'm not a big fan of that because then if you want anything, like your mocks get soaked and it's time to switch them or you get cold. <laughs> you want to pull out your knit cap if it's inside your bedroll. It's a little more of a, you got to tear everything apart and get into there. So Jake carries a knapsack, which are all over period accounts for sure. Um, his is just an ool style, I believe. If I remember if my words right. Um, based on an original one, it's just a pretty simple thing. You don't need a crazy contraption based on a bushcrafter's backpack. It's basically just a haversack, uh, just a rectangle, you know, fabric folded up, turned into a bag, and then straps sewn on the back. And then he's got ties here to go across your chest, which is a nice thing all the way to help this get the load kind of shifted, you know, off of just your back and up into your shoulders. Um, yeah, knapsack, great option. I myself use a market wallet, um, that one quote, a wallet well stored. That's another legit great way to carry stuff. It's just basically a big rectangle sewn up with a slit in the middle to get, you know, then basically have two bags. And the way that I carry these, and I, you see in period images, is just thrown over the shoulder, the one side on the back and one side on the front. And then I tuck, my, tuck mine through my uh, tump line strap to hold it in place. And I've never had an issue carrying it like that. Um, so what do we carry inside the wallet and knapsack? And really, this is a less is more game all the way, especially for this kind of a event. And I think it's important to kind of cater what you're carrying to the event. But if they're on Indian campaign, they weren't carrying a lot of stuff. If they were going on a long hunt, they were taking pack horses and junk. But this type of thing, they were traveling light, trying to, you know, pursue Indians. That's what we see in the original accounts. And so I try to pack light. And honestly, I'm kind of heavily packed right this minute. But just a simple food stuff. I have a bag of jerky. And that's it. I have a spare pair of moccasins for sleeping in the night. That's a common thing you see with you guys carrying spare mocks. Uh, I have scraps of wool for wrapping my feet in with the mocks to keep them warm. I have a little bit of coffee, just because I'm addicted to coffee myself. Um, a bag with tinder in it for getting my fire going. It's a little bit of dry cedar bark. And a bag for tobacco. And my uh, sewing kit or housewife, which is just a simple, yeah, if you, I think if you Google image search, you should be able to easily find period housewives. They're real simple little bag things for keeping sewing kit in, in case you need to do some repair on the field when your mocks blows out or your leg and rips out. You need to do some quick patching. It's a handy thing to have. 
And then a knit cap for sleeping in at night. I don't like to be cold myself. Okay, and Jake, he carries a little bit different. And this is the beauty of like, what's your bag trash, your pocket trash. <laughs> I personally find it fascinating with all the different things you guys carry. So Jake, he's got a pipe that he carries in his knapsack and a little candle box. Um, it's a reproduction of an original. It's basically a little box you can put a candle in and have light at night. If you're having a cold camp, you don't want to have fire, but you still want to have light. This thing is really cool. Um, here are some coins and a purse, a little silk purse. Uh, a vessel for eating, drinking out of, a little flask, and a uh, jug. And so the jug brings up two carrying water, and it... It's one of those things, I think, if we look at the period accounts, they're kind of, there isn't a lot of mentions of them carrying canteens. And it's a concession, though, that I guess we almost have to make as modern people doing this, because we can't really drink from every stream like they did. Uh, and you have different options there, obviously. You could carry a water filter with you as a modern concession, filter water from every stream and not carry a canteen. Um, but even then, it's just a lot easier to get by with a canteen. So Jake has an original... A reproduction of an original one wooden is by far and away the most common is wood canteens. There are some uh, tin canteens as well, and then the great debate on gourd canteens. Um, I'll leave that to a different discussion, but you have options for carrying water. Um, it's something to think about for sure because you don't want to get dehydrated and not have fun. Okay, and then so I carry myself for making my coffee and yada, yada, yada. And they're really commonly listed or archeologically very commonly found is a tin cup. Hot dip, hot dip tin is what you want, is what's correct. There's tons of makers these days that are doing correct tin. Just a simple search on Facebook or the internet. You should be able to find somebody. <laughs> and a kettle is another option for if you're having a messy guy, you're not gonna have a cold camp. Um, you can cook in it, make a big pot of stew, whatever. Drink rum out of it. Kettles are great. They're just a little heavier, bulkier to carry. If you're traveling light, something like this immersion event, I myself would probably just pack my tin cup as like my vessel. Okay, and then last but not least, we have to make our guns go boom, bags and horns. Uh, cartridge boxes, I don't, I haven't found those commonly mentioned as like a frontier thing. It's more bags and horns. They're loading from their horn, loading from their bag. Um, so we yeah. have two different styles here kind of and the sky is the limit on shop bags but it's another thing keep it simple if you want to keep it right there is so many bad bags out there these days and the original 18th century bags are fairly simple overall they don't have rings um a lot of them don't have buckles even uh they're just simple simple bags not tons of inside pockets or that type of thing they're certainly european like fancy bags but frontier style. I don't think those would have been common. Um, so Jake's, his is as if it was made in a, and simple, but still, you know, nice is what you see in the period. Labor was cheap. The, people did fine work. Uh, so he has like a harness style shop bag, which is something that would have come out of a professional leather worker's shop. Um, the very common style of shop bag is just veg tan front and a back, a strap added, no inside pocket, no divider, no anything like that. Just a simple bag. Mine's pretty dang similar, other than it's bark tan. And it's, I was kind of going for a little more, you know, made at home kind of look. And just simple, sewn together with a wang of bark tan. No inside pocket, no anything. I do have a buckle on mine, a simple period, original buckle. Uh, yeah, and it just bags, the simpler the better, is what I can't stress enough here. And horns, I carry a buffalo horn. Uh, the period horns, they're generally fairly large compared to what you see nowadays. Uh, cow horns especially have usually a double twist to them, um, meaning they curve up and then they curve in because they were being made from a breed of cattle that kind of hard to find these days. There's a lot of terrible, once again, like shop bags, terrible horns out there. Um, there's plenty of good makers. I would just say do your research before purchasing because they can be expensive too. It's not any big deal for a good powder horn to drop $200 on it. Um, yeah, so cow horns, buffalo horns are great options too. Uh, but I, it's one of those, There's they can be really intricate and be correct, but do your 
research before just tearing into it. Okay, and so that's what we carry. Um, event specific, I can't stress that enough. You should cater what you're carrying, how you're dressing to the event. What the, uh, you know, because it's not a one size fits all for this type of living history. You can't be like, well, I wear this for 1750s, I'm good enough. Um, it's just not where it's at. Anyways, uh, the next video I believe we're going to do is on food. And uh, thank you for joining us.